In this exciting episode, we get a cultural smorgasbord, an authentic frontier gibberish spouting set of townies, a Welsh contact person, and a seemingly British judge. It's enough to make a donkey demure, I tell ya. But Perry, he's right at home. In Perry Mason, Season 3, Episode 19, The Case of the Bashful Burrow. Welcome to the Perry Pod. I'm your humble host, Jonathan Searcy. My purpose here, pretty simple. Provide an audio companion to the greatest legal drama in television history, Perry Mason. I plan to do an episode of every episode of the television series, and as time permits, I'll get to some of those made-for-TV movies, too. I'll be working through the series in the order in which the episodes were aired. Each episode, I give you a brief refresher on the plot and compare it with the Earl Stanley Gardner novel it was adapted from. Next, I list some key pieces of trivia before tackling the episode's theme. Then we feature a Perry proverb where we look at a pearl of wisdom from the man himself before we head to the post-case water cooler where just like Perry, Della, and Paul, we can discuss the ins and outs of their adventures. But first, to the law library! Each episode in the Law Library, we investigate some legal conundrum in the episode so we can find fresh precedents for future cases. In this episode, Perry actually does put on a spectacle in the Placer City courtroom. He calls a borough to testify. But I still maintain that all of this is irrelevant. Since Amos Catledge has disappeared, and therefore cannot be called as a witness. That's true, Mr. Williams, he can. But the court has given me permission to call the next best thing, his borough, Sheba. The British judge, being from the United Kingdom and all, complies against the DA's strenuous opposition. Mr. Williams, this court's sole objective is to arrive at the truth, and if it takes a sideshow to do so, then well and good. Call the borough, Sheba. Well, of course, Sheba the Burrow doesn't actually testify. She simply identifies the disguised man that Perry really wanted to question. As for the legality of all this, animals can't testify in court. They can't be put under oath. They can't undergo cross-examination. If you want a fun, listicle read, however, pop animal court witnesses into your Google search box and read the first few articles about how everything from a parrot to various kinds of dogs have been useful in solving crimes. Perry's no stranger to the animal game, what with his howling dogs and perjured parrots. He's got enough animals to set up a side prosecutorial pet division. Well, now let's get to the plot of this episode. <laughs> The case of the bashful burrow. We open on young Sally Norton, minding her own business when fat cat Ken Bascom comes a calling. Yeah, he wants the land that Sally and her husband Gerald own, but he also kind of wants Sally. Ew. Yeah, let me have that. You're too young and pretty to be doing work like this. If you were mine, I'd have people doing this for you. Haven't I heard that you already have a wife, Mr. Bascom? Yeah, but... Uh, Arrangements still could be made. Bascom makes that clear to Gerald later. Gerald's no more eager to give in than Sally was. Gerald's been digging for gold, you see. It just doesn't appear there is any in the mine he inherited from his uncle. Bascom apparently wants the land for water. He's a big rancher, that Bascom. You'll recall that actor Hugh Sanders, who plays Bascom, has been playing Fat Cat Ranchers for a long time. His first appearance was in Season 1's The Case of the Fandancer's Horse. In any case, Gerald and Sally are holding out for a gold rush and give Bascom the kiss-off. But then things get eerie and dangerous. Even when slimy creatures like that Bascom keep coming around. <laughs> All of 
a sudden we've got the authentic Hollywood Gabby Johnson Memorial Frontiersman who shows up. They named him after a man of the cloth, called him Amos Catledge. And he's got a burrow, too. You know, it's been so long since you've called on us, Amos, I've forgotten how you like your coffee. A little cream, if you don't mind. Now I remember. Cream for you and a lump of sugar for Shiva. Well, Gerald takes Amos's news and heads to the bustling metropolis of Placer City. First, he stops off to ask Mrs. Bascom about her husband's whereabouts the night before. She's more worried that Gerald will discover her lover. I hope you never treat me that way. You didn't let him see you, did you, Roy? I'm not that crazy. Fact is, the only thing I'm crazy about is you. Oh, don't. What's wrong? That little mining man upset you. Oh, no, darling. No, I was just afraid that he'd seen you, that's all. Then, at Placer City's world-famous Frontier Days, Perry shows up. He wants to find Amos Catledge for a border dispute he's helping with. His contact man, a Welshman named Crawford Wright. His guide to that Welshman, Ken Bascom. Hey, uh, uh, looking for something, stranger? Uh, someone, uh, Mr. Crawford Wright. Oh, you mean the Welshman? He's the gent over there with a the scraggly beard eaten by himself. Thank you. <laughs> Perry sticks around long enough to see Bascom deck young Gerald. And when Perry, Gerald, and Sally can't find Amos, they head off to dinner. That night, the mysterious voice sounds again. Even creepier, someone murders Bascom. Mr. Mason, Jerry's been arrested. Arrested? For what? They didn't say. He found Mr. Bascom's body up on the ridge where he'd been shooting at us. And then when the sheriff came... Bascom's dead? Yes, yeah, somebody shot him. Oh, but it wasn't Jerry. you got to believe that, Mr. Mason. But the sheriff is holding him. Yes, that's why I came to you. Let the games begin. First, there's a lover's quarrel between the widowed Mrs. Bascom and foreman Roy Dowson. Amos takes off with some cash that Mrs. Bascom gives him when he tells her he saw Roy on the night of the murder looking mighty suspicious. And Perry's got other things on his mind. He gives Paul a shopping list. The state is going to try to wind up the preliminary hearing in one day. I want you to get some things for me. I'd shoot. A box of shredded wheat. Shredded wheat? A large box. Some plaster of Paris, a rope, a miner's pick, a sharp carving knife, a hunter's lamp, a pound of lump sugar. Uh, the same lump sugar bartenders use in old fashions? The same. Also a Geiger counter and a silver-plated horseshoe. Harry, are you feeling all right? Tip top. Now, I want these things by the noon recess, Paul. I'll meet you at the assay office. It becomes clear enough why Paul was getting all those goods so he could have the borough identify the debearded and Natalie combed haired Amos Catledge. <laughs> Get away from me. Get away from me. Get away from me, did you? Amos Catledge. But all this is a mere smokescreen. The real person of interest is the Welshman, Crawford Wright. He knew that mine wasn't a haven of gold, but for uranium. Stick it to him, Perry. Is this some kind of a trick? I put those rocks there myself? No, Mr. Wright. I removed the rocks you substituted for Gerald Norton samples. That ore came directly from the Norton mine. I know, because I put it in the sack. And it was for that ore, rich in uranium, that you killed Bascom, wasn't it? Not gold, uranium. Yes! The denouement gives us some more time in the Placer City's golden nugget so we can hear some authentic frontier boogie-woogie piano. Tickle those ivories! This was just to bring us luck. Now... Let's get trivial, shall we? Every episode in our trivia section, I give you three takeaways. A Paul is a subject worth investigating more. A Della is a deep dive into an actor or actress who appears in that episode. And a Perry is something we learn about our intrepid hero. Our Paul prompt for this episode. Okay, so the mine contains uranium, not gold. 
Great. I have no idea what that means monetarily. I have a guess that it's good. That is, it's better than nothing. But in 1960, how much cash could you expect to get out of a mine full of uranium? Was it equivalent to hitting an oil gusher? Was it like a mediocre gold mine? Take a look, fellow Pauls. See what you find. Our Della for this episode is none other than Ben Wright, our murderer, Crawford Wright. Before I go, Mr. Mason, would you mind telling me one thing? Here's 10 about Ben. Number one, Wright was born in London in 1915. Number two, he attended the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts in the 1930s and began acting in London's West End theaters soon after. Number three, when World War II broke out, Ben enlisted and served in the King's Royal Rifle Corps. Number four, he came to the U.S. in 1946 to attend a cousin's wedding and settled in Hollywood. His initial roles were on radio and included the role of Sherlock Holmes. New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, based on the stories by the late Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and featuring Ben Wright as Sherlock Holmes. And this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. Number five, he was on a host of 1950s and 60s television shows. Yes, three episodes of Perry. Remember him as Walter Loomis in the case of the terrified typist, season one. There was also episodes of Gunsmoke, Twilight Zone, Get Smart, Hogan's Heroes, and The Addams Family. Number six, he was in a variety of films in the 50s and 60s too, sometimes credited, sometimes not. Those films included The Power and the Prize, Pharaoh's Curse, and Judgment at Nuremberg. Number seven, his most famous role as Nazi Air Zeller in The Sound of Music. So that when his obit ran in the Chicago Tribune, over 20 years later, the headline read, Ben Wright played Nazi in The Sound of Music. An ignominious legacy, to be sure. If the Nazis take over Austria, I have no doubt, Herzella, that you will be the entire trumpet section. You flatter me, Captain. Oh, how clumsy of me. I meant to accuse you. Number eight, don't forget his classic voiceover work for Disney as Roger in 101 Dalmatians and as Mowgli's father in The Jungle Book. Number nine, Ben Wright was married to Muriel and had a son and daughter. And number 10, Ben Wright died in 1989 after complications from heart surgery. But he had one final screen credit as Grimsby in The Little Mermaid, which appeared after Wright's death. You know, Eric, perhaps our young guest might enjoy seeing some of the sights of the kingdom. Uh, something in the way of a tour. Here's our Perry. So, this episode marks the last time we will see William Tallman, a.k.a. Hamilton Berger, in the opening sequence, or any of the other leading actors, for that matter. This was a Hamilton Berger-free episode that the execs quickly put on air. It was already in the can after Talman had gotten fired the previous week. Note, then, this exchange that Perry has with the Placer City DA. I'll turn the witness over to our distinguished visitor from Los Angeles. Thank you for so describing me, Mr. Williams. Our local district attorney is rarely so generous. No questions, Your Honor. By the time this case is done, Perry himself is more crunk in the Placer City courtroom than he's ever been in the L.A. County courtroom. Way to go, Perry, and best wishes, Hamilton. Our theme for this episode is faux generosity. Always look a gift burrow in the mouth, I've been told. Let's start with these two clips. One from Ken Bascom. Hey, hey, how about me uh, standing here to drink, partner? Another from Crawford Wright. Nice to meet you, Mr. Mason. Sit down, won't you? Let me buy you some lunch. You know, free drinks, free food. These guys have to be on the up and up, right? Au contraire, mon frere. Let's see how Perry deflects 
their two invitations. Maybe later, partner. Uh, I've eaten already, thank you. Oh. Bascom and Ryder in it for themselves. Their philanthropy doth protest too much, methinks. Notice Perry's version of this move. Would you two do something for me? Of course. Well, I'm a stranger in a strange town, and I hate eating alone. Would you join me for dinner? Perry gives gifts, too, but he's never going to be a third wheel. There's no ulterior motive. He makes his motives clear. He doesn't want to eat alone. He'll fund the meal if Gerald and Sally join him. Offer accepted. And he's willing to be Gerald's lawyer later on. Now that's the kind of generosity we can all get behind. Now let's hear a Perry proverb. Sometimes you gotta raise your voice to be heard. Perry's got a client behind bars and the local law enforcement's denying him access. Perry raises the vocal volume and airs a Perry proverb while he's at it. Well, it's very brief, just that he shouldn't talk to anyone until he consults his attorney. Can't you tell him that? Keep your mouth shut, Gerald, you hear? Mason hath spoken. And that's pretty good advice, whether or not it's delivered directly or indirectly. Now, my throat is parched. You know what that means. Time to take a swig from the water cooler. You know, there is one thing I don't understand. Go on, Paul. Each episode in the water cooler, we give you deleted scenes, parts of the episode that didn't make the final cut. Three today. Number one, a lineup of who wore it better. Outrageous frontier beards on Perry, Paul, Della, Gerald, Sally, and the British judge in a moment forever commemorated in a sepia tone photograph. Number two, a scene of Paul sitting in his car, housing the box of shredded wheat, no milk necessary. So he has to go back to the store and get some more for Sheba bait. Number three, Amos Catlidge sets up a grooming side gig behind bars, catering to prisoners and beasts of burden. You clean up well, Amos. Don't grow that beard back. Our Paul prompt from the case of the singing skirt involved poker. We asked two questions. One, what's the difference between draw and stud poker? Answer, in draw poker, each player's full hand remains concealed until the showdown. In stud poker, some but not all of a player's cards are dealt face up. Question number two, did California actually distinguish between the two? Here's the answer from a 1985 LA Times editorial called Poker is Poker. And I quote, by local option, draw poker is legal in California, but stud poker is not. That is, if all the cards are dealt face down, the game is legal, but if one or more cards are dealt face up, the game is in violation of Penal Code 330. At least that's the way the state interprets the penal code, which doesn't bar stud poker per se, but does bar stud horse poker. The trouble is, no one can say for sure what stud horse poker is. A hundred years ago, in 1885, the legislature banned stud horse poker. 62 years later, in 1947, the state attorney general issued an opinion that stud horse poker was the same as stud poker. All law enforcement officials have followed the dictum. Legal scholar Nelson Rose rejects the contention that the legislature in 1885 intended to ban all stud poker. He notes that in 1891 it banned hokey pokey, which is four card stud, if the legislature had intended to outlaw all stud poker, he asks, why would it have banned a specific stud poker game just six years later? In Rose's opinion, what the legislature meant to outlaw a hundred years ago were casino games in which the house is the bank and bets against all players. But poker, whether draw or stud, is a game in which participants play against each other, with the house merely providing the table. The state wants to limit gambling, so it calls any new game a form of the dreaded and proscribed stud horse poker. Even the ancient Chinese game of Pai Gao, which is not even played with cards, end quote. From what I can tell, the distinction between draw and stud poker still holds, according to the California Penal Code. 
you might want to check out James Fisher's long article, Is Poker Legal or Illegal in California?, which is free on the web and full of footnotes for the budding legal scholar. Me, I'm folding before I lose my shirt. We got one letter this week from loyal listener April who writes about the community property law that Perry name checks in the case of the singing skirt. She writes, quote, when it comes to community property, I think the precedent to reclaim money spent gambling by one spouse would be good. Otherwise, in order to avoid having to share the money with said spouse, you could go and gamble it away. Who knows that the gambling spouse might have made a deal with the casino to split the money. Four reels, April. You can see why divorce-prone Californians would dig the Novo decision that Perry highlights and why gambling operators everywhere would be quaking in their boots. A small request. According to my podcast service, this pod gets downloaded nearly 3,000 times a month, which kind of blows me away. Thank you so much for listening. Over the five years I've done the podcast, however, I probably only heard from 40 people who listen to the show. So if you feel so moved, drop me a line to tell me why you dig Perry. I'd love more family memories or details about idiosyncratic Perry rituals you've developed. You can reach me at theperrypod at gmail.com. Next time we get acquainted with Matisse, you know, the wild beast of fauvism himself, It's a Perry painting caper in The Case of the Crying Cherub. Join us, won't you? Until then, this is Jonathan Searcy saying, Keep on walking that Park Avenue beat!